over to you, Joel. Thanks, Rebecca. Well, I am Joel, and uh, unlike Rebecca, I'm on the other side of the pond in the Chicago area. And so uh, I'll be walking you through a demo of GitLab Enterprise today. Um, we're going to just give you a brief intro, walk you through the platform itself, and then come back and, and uh, close out quickly. So that said, I just have one slide to show you. For those of you who are big into slides, I'm sorry, you only get one today. Uh, we're going to do most of this live. But, you know, I wanted to show you the vision and share with you the goal of GitLab. We want to be your one-stop shop, end-to-end -end development platform from idea through to production or even through to metrics and feedback, right? The idea of one-stop shopping, whether you're uh, in the planning, coding, testing, deploying, any of these different areas, we're trying to do it all for you within a single UI window. And so as you go through this, this demonstration today and we look at the platform itself, keep in mind this idea of the, the workflow that you see lined up on this screen, going from the planning through the coding and committing, through the testing, the reviewing, and moving it into production in a more automated fashion. So this is the direction that we're gonna to go today. So let's hop right into the demonstration. This is going to be live, and so you get to experience all the excitement of a live demonstration and all the interesting uh, nuances that can come with it. Okay, so at this point, you should be seeing my GitLab project. Welcome to GitLab. If you're a legacy user and you've been around GitLab for a while, uh, perhaps you haven't upgraded in a while, you'll notice right away that our UI is, is notably different in the last couple of months. And so if you're used to our old navigation, which came across the top of the screen, uh, you'll notice now we do have a, a bar across the top with a few options, but the left side is where all the action is. And so uh, right here, we landed in my ongoing project. This is my JK Inc. project. And uh, well, let me just show you what I'm working on. So if I click into my CI CD environment, uh, let me go ahead straight to my environments and show you what's going on in production. I can open up my production environment right here and out of the gates, we've got a typo. So what we'll do with the workflow here is actually create an issue and go through and fix this code and deploy it to production because we want this to not be misspelled. So you'll notice I can go right into my issues. I'm gonna spend most of my time here in issues, merge requests, and CI CD. And uh, later on, I'll give you a glimpse of our auto DevOps functionality as that's uh, one of our newer 10.0 plus functionalities. I can go into my issue boards and quickly work, add work, focus on different uh, sets of issues that are filtered by certain criteria. So I, I landed at my development board. Notice I've got multiple boards here. In our enterprise edition, we've got uh, different boards that are available with different functionality. Since this is a defect, I'll go to my P1 defects board. And a couple things you'll notice here. First of all, it filtered the board for me. It gave me a different flow from what the original board was. So I set it up with different columns. And it's also tied to a milestone. So in this case, I filtered my whole board by milestones as well as defects. If I go to milestones, this is one of those interesting things. Before I create my issue, you know, milestones are available for us to do a couple of things. One is I've got a percent complete. So they've got a start and an end date. If I click into that though, you'll notice I also get a burn down. And whether that's by the number of issues or by the weight of the issues for our sizing exercises, uh, this allows us to go through and validate that we're gonna hit our targets. A lot of times I see milestones used for iteration tracking or for release tracking. I can scroll down here and see what have we started, what's ongoing, what's completed, what's the total number of issues in play, what's the weight of the issues in play, and uh, over time, we can use these to, to help ourselves with improved planning. So I was gonna jump back in and create the issue, but I wanna show you one other thing before we get into that. And that is, this is one project. This is where we're working today. 
what if this project is just for my web browser? What if I've also got a, an associated product that's uh, related, but it's iOS based or it has other platforms associated with it? What if we've got multiple projects that have dependencies on each other? What if there's a relationship there? Well, that's where groups come into play. And so you can see here, I have group one that I'm a, an owner of, there's subgroups. What's important here isn't the subgroups today, it's the projects. So I've got three projects, three, four, and five, that are parts of this group. So administratively, I'm a member of all three projects, but here's where that issues piece comes into play. Notice I can set milestones at the group level. I can create boards at the group level. So if I click through on the boards, I have yet another view. Notice that now that triage column is planned. Okay, I can stare at a different view that goes across my project. So these are the group level issue boards. They're part of our 10.0 release. And this particular view is my 5.1 release across all the projects. Notice I've got project three over here, project five over here. These are issues from all the different projects in one view. And again, tied to milestone 5.1. So if I click into milestones and look, there's 5.1 and I'm 16% complete. So a common way this might be used is a release across projects. And so from that perspective, this is one of those interesting views that allows us to see things in a little different way. Okay, back to the problem at hand. We have got to fix that oh hello typo. So what I'm gonna do is create an issue on my board. So we're going back to that P1 board where you saw me before. I'm gonna click the plus sign here and we're gonna fix oh hello in GitLab. Okay, and I'm gonna submit my issue. Now notice that on the right side, something popped out right away and said, hey, these are the quick things that you might wanna consider. So I'm gonna sign myself because I added it to the board that's focused on the milestone, it also added this to the milestone. And then from a labels perspective, this is our way that we could quickly identify what things are bugs, what things are P1, what things are whatever. Uh, the labels are what help us to later on focus our work, sort our work, report back on our work. So I'm gonna consider this triage for now. I'm gonna click into my issue and you'll notice a couple of things. So first of all, there was a default template that was pulled in. This was set up at my project level. Now I can change this. I have some templates just for bugs. And these, this is part of my repository, it gets pulled in. Notice I've got emojis and things that are in here. So when I preview this, you'll see that this is what it actually is gonna show up like. I would ordinarily populate this with a lot of content, but hey, we've only got so much time for this webinar, so I'm gonna keep moving. One thing that's important though is a screenshot of the problem. Now, I just happen to have that right up here in the upper right hand corner. Isn't that convenient? And I'm gonna add that in and save the changes. Now, a couple things happen. First of all, my issue, now that it's saved, is displaying that, that uh, full version of, of uh, the template. I'm gonna call this a P1 again. And notice my screenshot has been pulled in right there into the issue. I can also relate this to other issues. So if you want a link or if you've got a duplicate or something like that, all I have to do is say, this is part of say number 35, okay? I can relate it to 35, I can relate it to 34, whatever. There's a, so now I can see the status of that other issue, which is green, which is good, it's in a closed state, uh, but it's gonna be related to that new sample site that we're working on. So from here, there's a couple of ways I can go to resolve this issue. The fastest way and the fastest way to link all my work together and give us collaborative visibility across all this stuff is to create a merge request straight from here. Now, your uh, terminology may be pull request. It may be um, a series of other terminologies. But in this particular case, this is what we call it, uh, is, is a merge request. And a couple of cool things happen. First of all, you see it says closes number 36 because we created the merge request from the issue, it dynamically said, hey, when this merge request goes through and everything looks good, we'll close the issue dynamically for you. You don't have to go back and do that. 
Secondly, it created a branch for me dynamically. So I'm gonna work from this branch. Thirdly, you see that we've got uh, approvals that have come into play right away. These are set up at the project level. They can be group level or individual. I encourage you, if you can, set it up for a group of people in case somebody's out of the office. And we can have one or more approvals. In my case, I just need one. Somebody needs to go in and review my code for me before I can merge it. So let's go to the branch and let's fix the issue. Oh, by the way, before we do that, did you notice my labels carried over from the uh, issue? And so the merge request inherits the, the issue labels. It allows us again to go back over time and take a look at uh, merge requests and sort them quickly. So let's jump into that branch and fix the issue. When I click on that, it's going to take me to my repository. Okay, here it is right on the branch that we're working on. And I know that I've got this server.rb file. This is the one that's got the error in it. Before we change that, did you notice there were some pipeline things starting to happen already? When we commit this change, a pipeline is going to dynamically run. The merge request actually showed some staging environments and things we're, we're starting to be aware. That comes from this file. And I'm not going to go into how this file is all built out. But the thing I want you to see is our CI pipelines are version controlled along with our code. And each of those pipelines is full of stages and jobs. So for any given stage, we can have multiple jobs running in parallel. So think from this perspective, when I commit this change, I want it to build, I want it to run a series of tests, build any relevant docs, spin up a review app, and ultimately deploy through staging, canary, or production environments. So below this, all these stages, the jobs are called out for each stage. Again, I'm not gonna go through all that now, but that's where this is gonna come from when you see it spin up in just a minute. So let me go back. And let's edit the file. If you are a command line user and you want to just use your command line or your other UI, your IDE environments, whatever, to make these changes, you can certainly do that easily enough. I personally love staying in my one browser window. And I've set up the colors here, which is part of my profile, to enable me to use the browser in the color scheme that I prefer. So knowing that I set it up the way that I want to use it, I'll just come in right here in the UI, make the change, fix the typo, and clear out a couple spaces. Update my commit message. And notice my target branch. It, again, it's an automated thing, right? This is where we're going to commit the change. I push the commit change button, and we're done. It's in. Well, what's happening? Let's go back to that merge request a minute. If I click on merge requests, here's the whip. The, the work in process merge limit, uh, merge <laughs> request. And here in this line, you see that we have a pipeline that's running with a bunch of different things going on. So let's click in and see what's going on in this pipeline. Well, the build job is running. Again, based on that CI file that I showed you, I have a series of eight different tests that can run. There's a doc phase and a review phase. And these are all the different stages with all the different jobs. For each one of these that's running, I can click in and see exactly what happened. In this case, I pulled a container, we ran the build, we kind of ramped things back down and put it away and came back out. Now, I'll show you a little later, when you run tests, you can also pull artifacts back, for instance. Uh, you know, what was the code climate analysis or static analysis of our code? What were the test results? They can come back in, we can view them right from this environment as part of our pipeline. So this is really exciting stuff. I've got insights into everything that's happening inside of each stage and each job. Now I'm going to come back a moment, and you'll see that it's still running. Let me refresh this a minute. The review app is currently building, and that's the thing I really want to get you to. This is going to be pretty exciting. When that review app is ready, uh, it'll be something we can all collaborate on. And this is what I love about the merge request. It's kind of the center of my universe. I understand the issue. There's a dynamic link to the issue uh, that we're working on. So I've got the context of this merge request. I've got the branch. I've got the pipeline results. I've got the approvals from code reviews. I've got the, uh, the whip status that allows me to be locked out from a, a merge until it's ready to go. 
And if I uh, look down here, I've got a whole discussion associated with this. So we've got a full history of anybody who was involved with this, as well as changes, code diffs. I can see quickly what the changes were. In fact, let's do that a minute. So Evan is a guy that's on my team. He's a junior developer. Uh, he's going to be my approver for the merge request. So let's hop over to his environment real quick. He's in a different browser. And he's going to click into this project and take a look at the merge requests. So here it is, the merge request we've been working on. The pipeline is complete now. Notice that everything is green here. We're in good shape. And it was deployed. Okay, so here's that review app that I was talking about. This is a temporary or ephemeral environment that spins up. And look, there's my fixed environment. This looks pretty good. So if I'm Evan, I'm saying, yeah, okay, it looks like you fixed the issue that was at hand. I can probably approve that. Let me take a quick look at your code, though, and we'll do a quick line level code review just to make sure you didn't do anything weird. And so, yeah, it looks good. I'm going to put a comment right there on the changed line and save it. Okay, going back to the discussions area, notice that now Evan Richards has commented on this file and the code diff shows up right there. So we can see everything that's changed. We can see who made the, uh, uh, the, gave the nod to this and Evan can now click the approval. So no more approvals are required. The merge button is still disabled though because we have a work in process status. So I'm not gonna do that from Evan's environment. I'm pretty happy with where we are right now. Let's go back to my environment. I'm gonna refresh my view here real quick so that I can see the approval that's in place. I'm gonna resolve that WIP status and I'm gonna merge this into the main line. Now, one other thing I'll talk about real quick is you saw the changes and the, the diff that we did on the code. Uh, one of the most recent things we did in our 10.1 release was to add the ability to to comment on images. So if I had added an image to my home screen and uh, that had been new to my repository, it would actually show up in here. I'd be able to click on the image anywhere and say, you know, I don't like that color orange in the Tanuki logo or whatever image I had added, right? I've got that ability. And so that's one of the, the newest things. It's really cool. It pulls yet more people into the discussion because uh, now we're not just looking at the code level stuff, now we're looking at things graphically. Okay, so what's gonna happen now is this, this review app is gonna be cleaned up, it's gonna be disposed of, and a new pipeline is gonna kick off. So let's go see what's happening. Our new pipeline, notice it's longer than the last one that ran. There's different stages now. So post-merge, the first area looks the same, build, test, docs, but now we're deploying to staging. Now in that uh, ci.yaml file that I showed you earlier, staging is automatically deployed to, but my canary and production environments are not. I left those jobs manual on purpose so that I can toggle those environments. If you're not familiar with canary, it's uh, in my world that you can see in the corner here, I've got a Kubernetes dashboard up. I can deploy canary pods. And so what that'll allow me to do is, is blue-green test things, essentially. It would give me the ability to test out on my user base. Let's say I change the background color to blue, right, if, or to red. And I could have user feedback coming in before we went all in in production with the changes. And so uh, that's yet another thing that's really neat about our Enterprise Edition. It gives you the ability to do that quickly by simply configuring that CI file. So if I go to my environments page, you can see that that uh, staging job was still running. So it's gonna take a, a moment for all that to translate and come through. So before I show you the staging environment has updated, I wanna point out the monitoring. And this is for both staging and production environments. If I click on this, what I get is the Prometheus monitoring data that's part of this. And so I have some information about the staging environment. The one that I really like is down here, CPU and memory usage. So per commit, uh, I can actually see the jump in memory usage or in the CPU utilization over time. And as we deploy, I can watch this rise. If you were looking closely, you actually saw the memory usage statistics show up in the merge request. And so from that perspective, 
you can actually see uh, the impact you're making dynamically as you're committing your changes and as you're doing the reviews. All right, back to the environments. Let's see if staging has been updated yet with that hello, and there it is. It has been fixed. So in this case, I have an option manually to deploy to Canary or to production. This, I just want to go to production. Production still says, oh, hello. And so I don't care about a Canary deploy. In this case, I'm gonna go ahead and send it to the production environment. And so that job is running in the background. Now, that was an end-to-end -end flow of work. My merge request has been uh, merged. My issue has been closed. Production has been updated. Let's go back to Evan's world. Evan, if you remember, Evan had a couple of projects that were on his screen. And while he was part of my project, he's also part of the innovation group. And so from the innovation perspective, uh, this is where he does a lot of his work. So let's go into that group. He really liked this project that we're working on. What he's been tasked with, though, is being more cloud native. And so he wants to grab my project as a foundation. And what I want you to see here is we're going to create a project and be to production in a 10 minute time window or less. This is one of the more powerful functions within GitLab. It's the new auto DevOps functionality. So let me create a new project in the innovation area. And again, he's going to import a project of mine. We're going to go by URL here. And I'll just, just call this uh, the JK Evan copy. Okay, we'll keep this pretty simple. This is going to import all the information that we've been talking about so far. It's going to pull it over from that repository, and here we go. Okay, there's that server.rb file again. And you're going to see a different workflow here. So I, as Evan, am going to jump in and make a change to this file. Now, because of the place I copied from, I still have the typo here, but let's say he's gonna start from a blue screen, blue background. So this will be the initial changes. Notice I haven't created an issue. I haven't created a merge request. I haven't created a branch. I've done nothing like that. What if I do just this? We're gonna to commit to a not master branch. Notice it allows me to start a merge request right from here. This is an expedited workflow in a more casual, innovative environment. And so this merge request, I'm gonna quickly assign it to me. I'm gonna remove the source branch when this thing is done, and I'm gonna create that merge request. Now, this pipeline started running dynamically. And what I wanna point out is that the pipeline itself is not something that I configured. Did you see me go to the repository and create a ci.yaml file? You, you didn't. And you probably didn't see that I did anything uh, when I imported that, that pulled that particular thing in. So um, what's going on in the background is that there's a series of jobs that are spinning up. And let's go take a look at that. So if I click into the pipeline here, what you're gonna see is there's a few jobs that have spun up. Build, code quality, test, and review. Again, I did not do anything in this project to set up that thing. So what happened? How come, how come I can run a CI pipeline without configuring anything? Well, the reality is uh, there is a Heroku-ish functionality that we're leveraging here. And it goes out and it says, okay, uh, I'm gonna build this thing and we're gonna look for, first of all, what kind of code are we developing? Oh, Ruby, okay, that's one of those top 10. I know what that is. And so what that does is it pulls in Heroku's build pack and test pack functionality to allow us to run through the pipeline at a basic state and say, does it build? What kind of code quality am I getting back? And just does a basic Heroku test pack run against this? Now notice the code climate thing, right? We ran through, we pulled it, we ran it, it came back with an artifact. So I can actually view my code climate analysis right from here. It enables me to do some of those things quickly and easily. 
Let me go back to my pipelines a minute. It says the review is passed. So if I go back to my merge request, and I apologize for a few extra clicks here. I'm all excited. I love using this stuff. It cannot find my server right now. And I know exactly why, because I jumped in a little too fast and forgot to, con to uh, click a configuration button on my end. So ultimately, if I rerun this pipeline, it's going to pass for me. And so I, I want to, to rerun that. Uh, what's going to happen, though, in this environment is now that that merge request was created, I actually can uh, approve that merge request and actually merge it into a production environment. So a cleanup runs here and a new pipeline kicks off. And notice again, it's different, right? Here's build, test, and review. Now I've got build, test, and production. So if I click in, it's gonna look the same. It's a build phase, a quick test phase, and a production phase. But what's happening in the background is not only are these jobs running, but when it gets to production, it goes out and creates a production pod in Kubernetes. And so with that pod created, I have now gone from a quick import to production in approximately eight to 10 minutes. And so it's enabling us to do things that we never did before. I didn't have to spend a lot of time configuring things. As Evan, I don't really even know anything about the cloud native environment. I really don't. But since we're set up to leverage this uh, Kubernetes environment that I've got active, I can now quickly and easily deploy into a production environment using this auto DevOps functionality. And so you see the difference, right? If I'm working as myself in the main environment, I've got a little more complex workflow, we have a lot more work tracking. If I wanna really move fast in an innovative, less structured environment, we can do that with a combination of different workflows and auto DevOps. And so this is still uh, running here, it's gonna to deploy to production in just a bit and I'll be able to go into my environments and see that the, um, the production environment will have a pod. We're not quite deployed yet. Since this does use the Heroku-ish uh, functionality, uh, there's, I noticed there's a question on the supported languages. There's a top 10 that uh, Heroku supports. You can look those up, but it's essentially the, the most popular ones, you know, the Maven, Python, um, Ruby world. And so you'd be able to look at that. Uh, there's definitely Go. Um, you'd have to look at the list for Heroku itself uh, for, for me to, to be able to uh, answer that question. I don't have that up right now. So dynamically, as the production uh, auto DevOps environment spins up, we're actually watching it, right? The, the pod just appeared. I could have one pod. I could have multiple pods. I could have a, a lot of things that happen here my monitoring is gonna also dynamically start. So because of Prometheus, it's gonna be able to pull in. And notice, this is brand new, right? I barely have any data back. I have this environment that's been up in general, but my, my first pod here has almost no data associated to it yet because it's fresh. And so if I open this, yeah, it's not going to open for me here. I've, I've misconfigured something earlier. I apologize. This is my production environment. Okay, it is up and it's ready to go. So I hope that kind of gives you a, a, an idea from a walkthrough perspective of some of the capabilities of GitLab and how we can work it, with various workflows in various environments with a lot of different functionality. So going back to the deck real quick, enterprise version of GitLab specifically, I showed you a few things, merge request approvals, um, you know, we didn't talk much about push rules or protected branches or any of those kind of things, but you got to see the deploy board. We got to talk about Canary deployments, uh, the performance and, and Prometheus monitoring. And then the other big component that's really hard to demo, of course, is from a scale and support perspective, when you get to the large enterprise, things like a distributed repository functionality, high availability of your servers, uh, your urgent support or, or maintenance walkthroughs, uh, upgrade walkthroughs from our support group, those kind of things come into play 
and are, are critical to larger enterprise success. So from a Q&A perspective, I only saw one question. It was about the, the, um, the what, what language was supported uh, it, for the automated pipeline setup. Uh, again, I'd have to look those up real quick. Uh, but if you look up Heroku build packs or Heroku test packs, you'll see the 10 supported languages that are associated with those. Okay, thanks so much for the demo, Joel. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, the questions that have been asked so far, I think, have been answered. Um, but if anyone else wants to submit a question quickly now that Joel can answer live, um, please do so. Um, otherwise, you can always reply to the recording email, which we will send out to you as soon as possible. Um, that's webcasts at gitlab.com. Anything you get from that address, you can uh, send a response to, and we will make sure that we get those questions answered for you. Um, and uh, yeah, otherwise, if there are no other questions, um, we can move on to the next slide, Joel. Um, and yeah, we would really just like to find out what you thought of today's demo. These are a relatively new thing that we're doing, and we tweak them all the time to make sure that they are useful to you and that you get something out of them. Uh, obviously, you can't click on that link because uh, Joel is sharing his screen, but I'm going to chat that link to you now. And we will also send it in the email that goes out to you with the recording. So you can um, fill that in when you get a chance. Um, that would be really helpful. Thank you. And um, if there's anything that you want to give a spin for yourself, um, you can download a free trial of GitLab EE. Um, there's no credit card required. It's valid for 30 days um, with no risks involved. So um, do give it a try if you want to see how anything works for yourself. And if you have any further questions that we can answer for you, you can also get in touch with sales at gitlab.com um, and they will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, everything from me. Uh, thank you very much, Joel, for the presentation and for Lee, as ever, for working backstage to get those questions answered as they come up. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us and for bearing uh, with us with the, the time zone issues. <laughs> okay, thanks so much again. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.